And my presentation today is called What If? Measuring Poverty and Disadvantage in Queensland. And I'm going to talk about uh, what we're calling the IF project and um, tell you a little bit about uh, where that is. It's very much a work in progress. And I'd just like to acknowledge a couple of the staff um, who aren't here today, unfortunately, who've worked on the project, and that's Brendan Radford and Susie Yates at QCOS in particular, uh, with help from many others in the team. So today I'm going to cover, first of all, what is IF? Um, and why did we do it? How we went about it? And what it's showing us? And then I'd like to talk about what we're going to do with it um, next um, as we continue to develop the work. So first of all, what is IF and why did we do um, it? IF stands for Indicator Framework. Uh, we variously called it Indicator Framework uh, or Investment Framework, uh, but the acronym works either as way. As you probably all know, Indicator Frameworks are increasingly being used to measure social wellbeing and progress towards a predefined goal. Um, such as closing the gap in Indigenous disadvantage or community wellbeing. So we first conceived um, of our framework as a way to demonstrate both the multidimensional nature of poverty, but importantly the links between poverty um, and other indicators and measures of disadvantage. Uh, at the beginning we had pretty lofty aims for IF. We thought if only we could you know, gather all this data together and put it down on paper or put it on the web and show all the links between it, we'd really be able to get politicians and others and policy makers to have a much better understanding of how this worked. You know, if only politicians could better understand that early intervention and prevention was the key, that addressing unemployment, improving income uh, would flow on to better outcomes in other areas such as family and community wellbeing. What if we could simply map the costs of poverty and disadvantage and show that if only we would invest more in affordable housing, family support services and employment pathways, we could save billions of dollars currently spent on statutory childcare protection systems and prisons. What if? But let's step back for a minute because while such aims are very worthy and we know all those things to be true, uh, it's a pretty big job to develop one simple, manageable and connected indicator framework that can ch achieve all of that. But we thought, what if as a first step, we could use existing data to paint a baseline picture of the extent of poverty and disadvantage in Queensland, compare how we're going against other states or indeed other places around the world, and then we could use this to set some targets about where we want to go and to have a conversation about what we need to do to get there. If there's a project to do just that, to collate a suite of population level indicators to measure the progress that's being made or not being made to reduce poverty and disadvantage in Queensland. I think probably I've almost answered this question as well, but just, just to go into a little bit more about why we wanted to do this. Um, normally it's a job that's done by government or research centres or you know people at the ABS. Um, but I would say in, this, in, this, in our very sort of specific and narrow focus, nobody else is really doing this. And so we thought we'd get the ball rolling. While there's some very good indicator frameworks out there, only a few of them ever focus on disadvantage. Um, and these are mostly at the national level. Too often measures of progress or well-being focus on the data of averages and they don't explore the experiences of those at the margins. Uh, and of course... Um, Mike gave the very good example um, about GDP. Um, so economic growth data might be sound. And GDP or GSP might be rising. Average wage, wages might even be growing at levels above CPI and in line with the cost of living. But is everybody experiencing the same thing? A good example of, the fact of this um, is the fact that income inequality was actually at its highest point in Queensland during the period of strong economic growth between 2004 and 2009. At its highest point, it started to decline again slightly uh, with the um, economic crisis. So Queensland's said to be a great state with great opportunities, but not everyone shares those opportunities. And a significant portion of the community face poverty and disadvantage. And we know it's concentrated in particular areas and amongst particular target groups. Um, and it results in intergenerational poverty and disadvantage. So through this project, our aim is really to improve the evidence-based policy and planning in Queensland and to raise awareness of the complexity of the issues around poverty and disadvantage. 
I think importantly the context is right for us to do this at the moment as well. Um, and I've just listed a few of the things um, that we've seen uh, in Queensland, sort of in the public domain, the Commission of Audit Report, um, more recently consultations on the development of a Queensland plan. And of course we've been hearing a lot about the need to move to outcomes-based uh, funding and, and uh, to getting better outcomes for, for our buck, etc, etc. Whether or not... Um, whether or not people think these particular things are heading in the right direction, what they do do is they um, provide an opportunity for us to have a conversation. Um, they, they really raise the question when you start to do things like, you know, set plans for Queensland for 30 years of exactly the question um, that Mike was suggesting earlier. Of where do we want to go? Do we even know where that is? And, and have we got ways to measure that? So how did we go about it? Um, like all good indicator frameworks, it needs a purpose or a name and this is ours, and it needs domain areas. So we chose five that we thought covered the field. Um, again, much smaller effort um, than the Australian um, National Development Index. Um, and there's no doubt could be debate about whether we've got the, these right, um, and, and indeed they, they could morph. Um, but for now, let's keep it simple, and these are the five that we chose. So we're looking at um, indicators in um, terms of ec uh, the economic area, health, education, housing, family and community. Um, from there, we analysed over 300 potential indicators and associated measures. And we, co we considered whether those indicators might be suitable for our purpose by looking at factors such as uh, the availability of the data, the frequency with which it uh, is available, uh, it's comparability. Uh, can it be compared? Can we compare Queensland with other jurisdictions? And uh, whether or not we can get regional or subpopulation data. After this analysis, we settled on the best set we could. And there's currently about 70 indicators in total. Now, no matter how hard I tried, I could not get all 70 indicators on one page so that you could but read. Today, instead, what I've opted to do is just show you one of the domain areas um, and the indicators that fall under that. Um, and it's the economic one. Under each domain area, we've grouped um, our indicators by key themes, and this, this is the economic uh, domain area. And um, these are the indicators for the economic domain. So you can see our key theme areas are income and wealth. And we have a number of, um, of uh, indicators there around income poverty, income inequality, net worth inequality. Um, I won't go through them all. Uh, employment participation is another important area uh, and financial ex um, stress and financial exclusion, uh, another. And so we've done this for each domain and we've organised um, the indicators under sort of themes in a similar way. And then we set about the task of actually uh, extracting that data and organising it into a report at this stage. And... There's a lot of things you can do with all of that data, but what, what, we, what we've tended to do is we've, we've looked at two things. First of all, we've looked at how's that indicator tracked over time? So have things been getting better or worse? So we've had to backtrack a little bit, obviously, as this is our first report. And then we've also looked at how is Queensland faring against other states? Is it doing better, worse? Is it much the same? Is there something that sort of stands out there? And now here's the tricky part. Um, Having gathered all this data, we really need to make sense of it in some way um, because there's a lot of it and, it and it tends to be, you know, quite difficult to manage. And so we're working on trying to establish some sort of rating or traffic light system to, um, to I guess, to place some sort of value, uh, very similar to an index, on how um, Queensland is performing against each of those um, indicators. Um, but as I say, it's a very tricky process and we're working through a few of the methodological considerations there. I mean, one of the things we often see is that we might well have a trend over time where we've seen um, something improving in Queensland, um, but yet it started from such a low base that it's still really difficult to, you know, to suggest that it's um, doing well. And, and often, despite that um, improvement over time, it may still, you know, Queensland may still lag behind the other states. Conversely, there are times where Queensland might rank quite highly. Um, and yet the um, level of disadvantage that the indicator is suggesting is really quite unacceptable. Um, and that's particularly the case when you're looking at um, some of the 
um, data relating to the outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in particular. We expect it to be a dynamic framework. We expect it to develop with future iterations. Um, and we expect to seek to try and gather regional, um, reg some regional data potentially as well as data at the state level. Okay, so what's it showing? This is a first report. Um, so it really doesn't allow us to uh, make much comment on progress towards or away from goals. Um, this first report really forms a baseline from which we might set some goals and track progress over time. Um, you know, I, I know this isn't going to be news to anybody, but I think um, it, it has to be mentioned because it's impossible not to observe that across every single domain area uh, there are significantly higher levels of disadvantage for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Really what it does show is that Queensland um, does rank poorly in many areas. Um, and in particular, I would highlight the economic and the health area. Um, but, but it also um, rates relatively well in others. And so it's not like there's just a clear picture. Just to sort of, I guess, expand on how we're ranking and, um, and, and how we're doing well in some areas and poorly in others, I'll just run through some of the domain indicators. Um, some of the domain areas, I should say. The economic area, um, as I said, includes themes of income and wealth, employment and financial um, exclusion. Um, generally, overall, um, Queensland's failing, faring quite poorly compared to other states and territories in terms of indicators of disadvantage. Um, the indicators in this domain paint a picture of people on low income in Queensland struggling to find sustainable employment with slow but steady rises in long-term unemployment and a decline in job vacancies coming off the slowing down of the mining boom. The, the level of income inequality is, is pretty average um, against other jurisdictions. We can't really ignore the fact that we've had an upward trend over the previous 15 years. Um, nor can we ignore the fact that one in eight people in Queensland live in poverty, um, and this tends to be higher in um, regional Queensland. Queensland has the second highest rate of unemployment of any jurisdiction and the highest rate of unemployment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, almost one in five or 19.5 per cent of people, um, unemployed people, have been unemployed for more than one year um, and the rate of underemployment is also rising. Um, there are some positives in there, I guess you could say, um, in that our rate of workforce participation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, is the second highest. Um, and also, um, Queenslanders are the second less likely to be excluded from financial services compared to other states. The health domain. Uh, this domain includes indicators about mental and physical health, lifestyle risk factors, health conditions, mortality rates and infant birth weight. And it's important, of course, because research on the social determinants of health um, clearly show that the most disadvantaged people in society bear the greatest burden of ill health. Um, Again, this is an area where I think um, there's some concerning data. Um, in 2011-12, Queensland was ranked highest um, in terms of the proportion of people experiencing unemployment or involuntary job loss as a stressor, uh, personal and family stressors being one of our um, indicators here. Um, the proportion of the total population in Queensland experiencing high or very high levels of psychological distress um, has actually fallen um, in Queensland um, and while it's below the national average um, we still ranked fairly poorly against other jurisdictions coming in six. The proportion of Queenslanders with very good or excellent self-assessed health status has been relatively stable since 2001. Um, unfortunately though we're actually ranked last out of all other states and territories on this indicator. Overweight and obesity levels in Queensland are worryingly high and they're growing. The proportion of the Queensland population who are overweight or obese has increased um, from 2007-8 to 2011-12 and we rank poorly compared to other states and territories with only two other states having higher rates. Um, it's probably not surprising therefore um, that as a state we're pretty bad and we're getting worse at eating our two and five. Um, only one in 20 of us consumed an adequate amount of fruit and vegetables in 2011-12. Um, and we also ranked poorly in terms of being healthy eaters when compared to other states and territories. And I'm assuming that's very much the impetus for the question in the Queensland plan uh, that the government's asked about what we can do to improve our um, health, our eating and our uh, exercise level. But of course, um, what's important about all of this is that the results are much more dramatic for people living in low socioeconomic areas. 
Uh, for example, 97.3% of people in the first quintile of the CIFA, that's the socioeconomic index for areas, I think, um, uh, failed to have adequate consumption of fruit and vegetables. Uh, so that's the most disadvantaged group, essentially. And so, you know, generally in the health domain, low-income Queenslanders are disproportionately affected by a range of um, risk factors such as access to healthy food, um, smoking, exercise. And I guess this supports that targeting of preventative health um, supports to this cohort could reduce the burden of disease overall. Um, and that would seem like a worthy investment given the costs we know that flow from... Um, from the, uh, some of the diseases caused by, you know, lack of exercise and lack of healthy eating. Education. This domain encompasses early childhood through to attainment of um, educational qualifications. And it's an important domain area because we know that positive and sustained educational achievement um, for many people provides a pathway out of disadvantage. Um, we have some positives again. We've seen uh, enrolment and attendance in early childhood and education um, care um, in, increase, um, but it was increasing from a very low base. Um, and uh, Queensland is unfortunately the poorest poor performing jurisdiction in this measure by a significant margin. Um, unfortunately, the enrolment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, in early uh, childhood education and care in Queensland lags behind the rate for the total population. Uh, and in 2011, only 45% of children, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were enrolled in a program compared to 68% of the total population. Um, we've made some progress on reducing the number of children or the proportion of children with one or more developmental vulnerabilities, but again, we rank very poorly compared to other states and territories. This, this one here is one that I have heard from a number of service providers as increasingly being an issue for them. Um, and we've actually seen um, in 2012, 2,580 um, young people excluded or had their enrolments cancelled from Queensland schools. The rate of exclusions and cancellations in Queensland um, has in actually increased quite sharply over a four-year four period. I guess, you know, again, just to mention that there's um, very clearly in the data a very direct correlation between non-school qualifications, the level of that, um, and socioeconomic status. Um, housing um, is... The next domain, obviously, again, important to us because shelter is a fundamental uh, human right and access to secure um, and adequate housing is very important for social inclusion. Um, Queensland actually ranks ahead of the national average for housing affordability. Um, nonetheless, it is defined as non-affordable in terms of um, home, home purchase. But the really important thing here, again, is the relative stresses. Um, in 09-10, um, low-income households spent 24% of their income on housing compared to 16% of the general population. And, of course, that's an average across low-income, and we know that many low-income people spend much more than that. Um, but, again, Queensland was actually um, the second-worst jurisdiction in terms of um, that pr proportion spent by low-income people, even though we're doing much better in terms of housing affordability overall. In uh, 2011, 19,800 people were homeless, and to put it in perspective, that's about the size of the population of Gympie. Um, again, uh, we're not performing terribly well in this area. Um, we had the third highest proportion of the total population who were homeless in 2011. Uh, alongside these figures um, is a low rental housing vacancy rate um, and uh, with, it's probably not a surprise with Queensland having the second highest proportion of renters in Australia and it's compounded by, with, by a disconnect between dwelling completions and population growth, uh, meaning, meaning that we have um, really a, a lag in supply of affordable housing. And finally, family and community. Um, this is a bit of a mixed bag of, um, of different themes and includes themes of social cohesion, justice and community safety, child safety and suicide. Despite the images of the Mud Army as being representative of the state of Queensland, um, in 2010 we actually had the lowest rate of volunteering. Uh, it would be interesting to see whether those figures have changed since 2011. Um, we actually have better than national average for imprisonment and recidivism um, and we have actually the third lowest ratio of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander to non-Indigenous prisoners. But again, I don't think there's any uh, measure by which you could say um, that the overrepresentation of 
um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our prisons is acceptable. I think this is one area of real concern for Queensland. The number of children living in out-of-home care has actually increased by 24.2% since 2007. And there's also been a 79.4% growth in young people living in residential care in the same period. And particularly um, concerning within um, that area of child um, child protection and out-of-home care is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people are overrepresented at all stages um, of the child protection system and it's it's been increasing over time. So Queensland's Indigenous children are around five times more likely to be subject to a notification, six times more likely to be subject to a substantiation order and almost nine times more likely to be living away from home uh, in out-of-home care. So that's um, basically a, a snapshot across all of the indicators. Where next? Well, uh, there'll be a report um, available from QCOS in October, um, and that's part of the plan is to develop this content further, particularly in terms of some of the linkages between these indicators, looking at some of the costs of disadvantage and what, in fact, might be some of the benefits and, and um, economic and social benefits of investing in the right places. Uh, we want to use it to advocate for improvements in policy and programs to address poverty and disadvantage. That's the point of Obviously, it would be important for us um, if, if, if government was interested in adopting some of these measures as part of its work um, in the Queensland plan and, and um, you know, for other similar plans. Really, it's about highlighting where some investment is needed to, to make a difference um, as a tool for advocacy um, or in the case of government to assess where their efforts should be focused.